So before you watch this video, I thought I should explain a couple of things. Normally for a video like this, we would plan it out and then shoot all the footage over one or two days. But because we are under the strict Welsh COVID lockdown, it meant that we had to wait until our work and our other projects took us to those locations so we could just turn the camera on and jump out and say a few lines before going back to the work we were doing in those places. So that's why it looks like this video was shot over the period of about a month, because it was. But hopefully it still makes sense. So this is a video about foraging. Yeah, for a time of year when there isn't really that much green stuff around. It's not going to be a comprehensive rundown of every species that you might find in the UK at this time of year. More, I hope it's going to be something inspirational. So you can go out and find something wild and edible near you right now. For the past decade and maybe a wee bit longer, I have spent the months between April and October each year running foraging courses, wandering around woodlands, along riverbanks, along the coastlines of North Wales. We run the courses during those months because, well, if you're coming here to learn about wild food and wild edibles with me and paying good money to do it, then I need to have plenty of examples out there on the ground to show to you. That doesn't mean, however, that you can't find anything to eat in the rest of the year. It just means you have to work a little harder. As we come out of what has been a harsh winter in every sense, it is of no surprise that many of us are looking towards nature and the coming of spring. When you step into the woods at this time of year, you get the sense that something important is about to happen, that life is about to return to the bare earth. But if you look closely, you can see that it never left. There are plants that have survived throughout the winter. There are species that thrive in these cold, short days. And of course, there are the early arrivals of some seasonal favorites. Let's start with this one, a real hidden gem. It's called opposite leaved golden saxifrage and it's often overlooked later in the year. Basically after March, this is swamped by all sorts of other things. You don't really see it, but it grows in carpets along the edges of watercourses and damp areas. Often here, like where you've got water coming off a hillside and filtering through some flatter soil before it makes its way down to the river over there. It's fairly easy to identify. It's got these leaves and, and a tiny yellow flower at the top. So it looks a bit like a cabbage leaf stuck onto a stalk, only tiny. It's got a peppery taste with a crunch that's reminiscent of cucumber, like you get with all large celled succulent plants. And I use it fresh in stir fries, Thai dishes, and things like that, because it, it doesn't really cook that well. It kind of goes to a green mush if you cook it for too long. But if you wash it and throw it in at the very end of a stir fry dish in the last few minutes, then it's a really good addition. It's also really good in salads too. I'm not dead. Of course, you're gonna to have to think about safety. So you've got the really obvious things like making sure you identify everything properly and that you're not about to put some deadly look-alike in your salad, but you also want to think about contamination. In a natural environment, everything is potentially contaminated. It might just be with bits of dead leaf or soil, but it might be some deadly parasite, liver fluke, or the runoff from some farmyard chemical spill. The point is that it is down to you to make sure that whatever you're putting in your mouth is safe to eat. And if you don't know how to do that, then you need to go and read up on that before you go out foraging. Right, on to mushrooms. When it comes to edible fungi, people tend to think about autumn. Misty mornings, long shadows, hunting for porcini and chanterelle. When it comes to these winter months, then, well, you need to look beyond those superstar headline species and look for the, well, slightly underloved things. Well, like this one down here. 
This one is these days called wood ear or jelly ear. It grows almost exclusively on dead or dying elder stumps like this one. And you'll find it anywhere in damp, deciduous woodland. And it's actually easier to spot at this time of year because there are fewer leaves around obscuring it from view. It, as mushrooms go, it's pretty uninspiring. It's got a taste somewhere between, well, around about a peppery miso soup. And it's got consistency of a Haribo sweet. But if you dry it, you can throw it into stews or broths. And there's a few Chinese recipes that involve using mushrooms like this. And you can take it when it's moist and fresh like this and throw it into stir fries and cook it up with bacon or stronger, darker meats or whatever your vegan alternative is. One of my favorite uses for it is to take the mushroom and to steep it in rum. And then once it's absorbed as much rum as it possibly can, take that and dip it into molten dark chocolate, which gives you an alcoholic fungal Turkish delight. So it's at this point, some of you will be rushing along to the comment section to tell me that the proper name for this mushroom is Juzir. Whilst it's difficult to escape that rather unfortunate name, even the Latin name is Oracularia Oracula Judea, the current practice, for very understandable reasons, is to call it wood ear or jelly ear. Now, somebody is going to be writing something along the lines of, well, you see, it's because Judas Iscariot hung himself from an elder tree after betraying Jesus. So it's not the ear of all Jews, it's the ear of Judas, just that one particular Jew. So ask yourself, is it really worth going to such lengths to justify such a divisive name? Or are you just talking complete bollocks? Locks. We get real problems with that one rusting up all the time. Anyway, further down here in this woodland, we've got another edible mushroom. It's called Scarlet Elf Cup, and it looks a bit like discarded litter or plastic or a, an upturned Coke bottle top. Its edibility is vaguely in question. Some people don't seem to get on with it. It might be due to their physiology or their diet or lots of other factors. So do some research for yourself. I do eat it. I often throw it into risottos and even fry ups and things like that. This is, this is quite a versatile little mushroom as long as you only really use it fresh and don't expect too much flavor from it. It's also a bit of a seasonal marker for me because I tend to get excited when I see this because it means that we've come to the end of the, the long colder months and spring is just about to arrive. So when you start to see this mushroom growing in quantity, you know that that buffet of wild food of spring is about to appear. Remember, this isn't a lecture on how to comprehensively identify any of these species. And let's face it, YouTube is a terrible medium for learning plant and fungi identification. And if you are relying entirely on some outdoor influencer for your outdoor education, then you're making some poor life choices. It's generally a good rule in life to know exactly what you're about to put into your mouth. And ultimately, you're responsible for what goes in there. Identification keys like this, I think, are still one of the most reliable and best ways of identifying things out here in the field. You can pick up secondhand books that are still relevant and have all the same information in them for pennies, and they might quite literally save your life. So go and pick up a couple of guides if you don't already have them. And if you look in the notes below this video, I've put together a a few titles that I recommend, but it should be quite easy for you to spot which is a good title because are they giving you good and relevant information that you can use or are they just trying to take your money because they hit the keyword foraging in the Amazon search results? I'll let you decide for yourself. Right, back to the red hot foraging action. This is an easy one, wild garlic, AKA buckrams, AKA ramsons, AKA that green leafy plant in damp woodland that smells of garlic. It's an allium and it's fairly easy to identify, 
harvest and use. You can take the really young small leaves and put them into salads and sandwiches. The more mature leaves are for pestos or for soups and you can wait a few weeks and have the flowers and put those into stir fries or salads. I know somebody who puts them on cakes of all things. And the seed heads that are left behind from those flowers in the middle of the summer, well, you can take those and pickle them and use them as a kind of a garlicky caper if you put them into some white wine or cider vinegar. If you're unsure of where to begin with harvesting your own wild food in the UK, then this is a pretty good place to start. Think about it as more of a garlicky spring onion than as a direct replacement for the cloves of dried garlic that you already have in the kitchen. The roots are also edible and they're quite good, but you'll need the permission of the landowner to dig up any wild plants in the UK. Yes, even in Scotland. And there are a few protected species that you may risk disturbing whilst digging up wild garlic roots like bluebells. So you need to take that into account. And while we're talking about wild garlic, we should mention that there's a toxic plant that you may easily accidentally harvest when picking wild garlic, and that's it's this one, which is called Arum maculatum, or Lords and Ladies, or Cuckoo Pint, or Arum Lily, or one of many other common names you might hear it referred to as. All parts of this plant are toxic, particularly so the little stack of red and orange berries that will form after the flowers and the leaves have wilted away in mid to late summer. But at this time of year, what you want to look out for are the very young leaves. So the more mature leaves like this are quite distinctive, but the young leaves can look very, very similar to very young wild garlic. And if you're going through gathering things, by the handful, then you're quite likely to accidentally gather a few of these leaves. The leaves are an irritant. They irritate the mouth and the lips and the digestive tract and any other sensitive parts of the body, external or internal, that they touch. Now, this isn't lethally toxic, and I could find you a few more deadly plants here in this woodland, but there are none that you're more likely to gather an unfortunate accidental handful of than this one. If you head down into the valleys, particularly near the towns and villages and the urban heat islands you get there, you can start to track down some other early edibles like hawthorn. These leaves are just starting to burst out from the branches and by the time you watch this there will probably be some young hawthorn leaves appearing somewhere near you. They're particularly tasty early on in the season and you can eat them straight from the branch or you can consume them with as little or as much preparation as you'd like. There are a good few recipes for hawthorn leaf puddings, including one that involves steaming bacon alongside the leaves inside suet pastry, and even a couple of recipes for hawthorn leaf gin. Several people have pointed out to me how many of my uses for wild plants and fungi involve either alcohol or bacon. Sheltered lanes like this are great for finding those young, easily identified plants like stinging nettle and dandelion and lesser celandine. But anytime you're foraging alongside a road, you need to consider some of the specific hazards here. So that might be being clipped by a vehicle when your head is buried in the hedge, or it might be contaminants, things like brake dust, clutch dust, spray off the road, exhaust, and just whatever fell off the most recently passing farm wagon. The most reliable venue for foragers is down here on the shore. You've got over there seaweed and periwinkles and mussels and limpets and crabs and enough fish to keep you going year round. And that's kind of the point. The hunter-gatherers that were here tens of thousands of years ago hung around in the coastal areas because they were reliable sources of food in those lean winters. So maybe that's not a terrible strategy for you as a modern hunter-gatherer. One thing to note if you are going out to collect seaweed is collect the specimens that are attached by a holdfast, by this route to a rock somewhere here in the intertidal zone 
or above the low tide mark and below the high tide mark there. By going out there on foot to collect them and only collecting things that are attached to the rock and growing and living and healthy like that, you vastly reduce the risk of gathering one of the few toxic species that drifts into the English Channel every summer. Contamination is still an issue with any aquatic foods, but generally less so with seaweed. If you are out foraging along the shore and in that intertidal zone below the high tide mark and above the low tide mark, then you'd still need to exercise some caution when it comes to shellfish. Toxins that are present in the water in some areas can build up in certain shellfish, and then that can end up in the food that you're consuming, and it'll end up in the meat that you're putting into your body. So. I've put another link in the description below that links out to a blog post that should give you some more information on that and some other places where you can learn about those potential hazards. So that's where I'm gonna draw things to a close. There are plenty of other species out there at the moment. You just need to put in a little bit more effort into hunting them down. There is nowhere in the UK where right now you can't find something wild, edible and free within walking distance of your front door. It doesn't have to be some rare and famed ingredient worthy of a gourmet restaurant. In fact, ecologically speaking, it's more important that it's something simple and boring and common. Whatever you're gonna go and forage next, just make sure that you are 100% certain of how to identify it, how to use it, and what the laws are for your area. I've put those links in the description below and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thanks for watching. Ah, in before the rain. <laughs>